My name is Guy Kawasaki. I am Chief Evangelist of Canva, and I am the creator of the Remarkable People podcast. And I am going to talk to you today about innovation um, and innovation that I learned in Silicon Valley, uh, innovation that I learned in Sydney, Australia, uh, working with companies such as Apple and Canva and Google and... Oh my goodness, that's, there's, there's almost too many to mention. So that that's the lesson that I would like to pass on to you, okay? And I am going to use uh, slides. So I am going to share my uh, screen. Okay, so for the third time, I'm telling you, I'm talking about the, the art of innovation. And uh, you alluded to my connection with Guatemala. So my actual first slide, this is a slide that uh, picture that was taken about uh, 19 and a half years ago. So I have two adopted children from Guatemala. This is my daughter, Noemi. So this is uh, her first flight uh, from Guatemala to Los Angeles. And I have, uh, we, we have adopted her and her brother. So we have two Guatemalan children. And um, people say that we even look alike. So. <laughs> So that's my, I have a very intense connection with Guatemala. So that's, that's, uh, I dug this picture out to show you. So that's my daughter from Guatemala. Um, so let's talk about the art of innovation. And I learned this working for Apple, as well as Google and Canva. And the thing that I learned in Silicon Valley and in tech, and I think Timothy would absolutely agree with this and absolutely uh, second this emotion, is great change happens because you jump to the next curve, not because you stay on the same curve. It's not because you do the same old brick and mortar banking. Uh, it's not because you do the same old copper wire telephony. It's because you get to the next curve. And I'll use a very old example. So there used to be an ice harvesting industry in America, and this is the late 1800s. People would go out into these frozen lakes and ponds with these horses and sleighs and saws, and they would cut blocks of ice. That was ice 1.0. Ice 2.0 was now you had an ice factory. You could freeze water centrally. This is much better. You could have an ice factory in Guatemala. You could not have ice harvesting in Guatemala. And then ice 3.0 was the refrigerator curve. Now, the ice factory's advantage was that it didn't have to be a cold place and it didn't have to be a cold time of year. The refrigerator's uh, uh, advantage is that it could be Anywhere, it could be in your house. You didn't have to deal with an ice factory. And so ice 1.0, ice 2.0, ice 3.0. But the very interesting thing is that, believe it or not, no ice harvester became an ice factory and no ice factory became a refrigerator company. And that is a very important concept in innovation that it is about getting to the next curve. Second thing I learned about innovation is you have to work backwards. And working backwards means that Instead of looking at what you're currently doing, harvesting ice, freezing water centrally, you have to go to the customer and work backwards from the customer. What does the customer want as opposed to what are you currently doing and what are you capable of doing? And so th this is crucially important to understand you know, when to get to the next curve, what the next curve should be. It's not based on what you can do, it's based on what people need. And I will show you a negative example. So this is a picture of an engineer at Kodak. This, is pic this picture was taken in 1975. And believe it or not, believe it or not, that thing on the table there, that is the first digital camera ever made. Now, stop here and think about this. So Kodak made the first digital camera. Now, if Kodak were working backwards, they would have said, well, you know, what our customers want is not so much chemicals on film or chemicals on paper. What our customers are really getting from us is the preservation of memories. That's what people want to do. They want to preserve birthday parties. They want to preserve sporting events and weddings. That's what they want to do. So working backwards, you know, they want to preserve history. They want to preserve events. They want to preserve memories. Let's work backwards and see how we can do that best for them. But Kodak had an attitude of working forward. We are in the chemical business. We make chemicals. We put chemicals on paper. We put chemicals on film. Kodak should have realized it's in the preservation of memories business, not in the chemicals business. 
The third thing is to ask a very simple question. I think great innovation occurs because of simple questions, not because of diabolical, world-changing, denting the universe kind of big plans. It's very simple questions. So let's say that we go back in history to just as cell phones were coming out. And you, know, you, you look at the cell phone and it's getting smaller and smaller and cheaper and cheaper. And pretty soon there's a cell phone with a camera. Obviously that cell phone is on a data network. And you think, oh, well, so there are going to be lots of people with phones that have a camera. So therefore what? What business could we start? And I think you might have come to the conclusion that you should start something like Instagram, where you can share photos. So you take your vision and your passion and your ability to predict the future and see the future, and you ask yourself, well, in that future, therefore what? I mean, in the pandemic, when you see that people cannot be in physical classrooms, therefore what? You know, how, what kind of business, what kind of service can we offer based on the fact is that, you know, for a long time, people are not be, not be, not going to physical buildings. You might have come up with the idea of Zoom. So the question to ask is knowing what you know, seeing what you're seeing, Predicting what you're predicting, ask the question, therefore what? The fourth thing is to get high and to the right. And I'm not talking about drugs or politics. I'm talking about positioning and branding and your mental space. And so this is a very simple chart. Differentiation. How different are you? How different is your product or service on the vertical? Horizontal. How important is it? How valuable is it? So if you're far off to the right, there, you have lots of value, but you're not different. You always have to compete on money. You have to compete on price. If you're in the upper upper left corner, that's where you're very unique, very different, but you have no value. There, you're just stupid. In the bottom left corner, that's the worst corner of all because you have something that's not valuable and there's a lot of companies doing the same thing that's not valuable. So, for example, in America during the dot-com days, there were several ways to buy dog food online. but it wasn't really useful because you could discount the dog food because you didn't have a dog food retailer, but uh, then you had to add back shipping and handling and somebody had to be at home when the dog food came to your house. So it was not valuable. And then stupid people like me in Silicon Valley, we funded four ways to buy dog food online. So the corner you want to be in is the upper right-hand corner. That right-hand corner is where you have something that is unique and valuable. And I think when the iPod first came out, it personified this corner. It was the only tool that a mere mortal could use because of its user interface. It had a wide selection of music. It was music that you could legally and easily install on your device and inexpensively, 99 cents per song. There was nothing in the world like that. It was easy to use, wide selection, cheap and legal. And that's why iPod succeeded. So I'm asking you, as you think of the, the device, the service, the product, the company that you're trying to create, you know, give yourself this test. Is it unique and valuable? The fifth thing is don't worry, be crappy. That is, at the start of a great revolution, a great innovation, your first version is not going to be perfect. You are going to look back and say, oh my God, I'm embarrassed by what we shipped. And here is an example. This is a Macintosh 128K with Steve Jobs. Okay, so this computer was $2,500. It had 128K of RAM, had a 400K floppy drive. Thanks to my efforts, there was no software. The monitor was only black and white. It was only nine inches. Now, I have to say that there's a part of me that's embarrassed. Oh my God, what were we thinking? We shipped such an underpowered little, you know, machine. But at the time, it was the next curve of personal computing. And so what I learned is that, you know, when you get to the next curve, ship it, ship it. You cannot wait for perfection. And if we had waited for chips and, and monitors and software and storage, if we had waited for the perfect world, we would have never shipped and life would have passed us by. So don't worry, be crappy. Now, I am not saying ship crap. I am saying if you are on the next curve, if you've created the next curve, get it out there. The sixth thing is to let a hundred flowers blossom. And by this, I mean, 
you take your positioning and your branding, you know, what is your product, your service going to do? Who's going to use it? And you get it out there. And then you might have a very, very surprising result, which is people that you thought were going to buy it don't buy it. And people you never considered as a potential customer do buy it. And they may even use it in ways you did not intend. So with Macintosh, we thought it was a spreadsheet database and word processing machine. Guess what? It was rejected in all three markets. And the market that it succeeded in is a market we did not anticipate. It was desktop publishing. This is a screenshot from an early copy of PageMaker. So PageMaker doesn't take a rocket science to figure out what PageMaker does. It makes pages. And so this was the killer app of Macintosh. No PageMaker, Apple would have died. And so this is an example of a flower that bloomed. Apple didn't plant this flower. Aldous planted this flower. And without this flower, Apple would have died. Let a hundred flowers blossom. Don't be proud when people embrace your product or service and use it in ways you did not anticipate. The seventh thing is that great innovators change their mind. They are not afraid of changing your mind. Changing your mind is a sign of intelligence and courage. This is an example. When Steve Jobs announced the iPhone on June 11, 2007, he said, our innovative approach using Web 2.0 based standards lets developers create amazing new applications while keeping the iPhone secure and reliable. Let me translate what he's saying. He's saying the iPhone is a closed system. You cannot add functionality other than Safari plugins. A year later, Apple executives to showcase Mac OS X Leopard and OS X iPhone development platforms. A year later, Apple opens up the iPhone. It's complete reversal of direction. If Apple had not reversed its initial closed architecture, iPhone would have not succeeded and maybe Apple would not be here today. So contrary to what you might think, changing your mind is a sign of intelligence and it is a sign of courage. Number eight. Number eight is innovators remove speed bumps. Speed bumps that just are a barrier to adoption. And often when you are in a company, you don't even feel, you don't even see, you don't even experience the speed bumps that you are putting up in front of your customers. One of which is an example that most people are familiar with, which is this kind of stuff. This is when you want to sign up for an account, when you want to pay, when you want to check out, when you want to do something, register, you have to go through CAPTCHA or you have to select all the images with chimneys. Huh. And every time I encounter one of these or capture, I swear, I swear, it takes me at least four or five tries to get past this. And this is just ludicrous. I mean, it, it's almost as if you're saying, well, you know, we really, we really don't want too many customers. We're going to try to put enough speed bumps in front of them so that not all of them can get through. This is utterly ridiculous. Remove the speed bumps. Number nine. Number nine, there were political revolutionaries in America, the Black Panther movement, that had a saying, burn, baby, burn. But what I think that business innovators do is churn, baby, churn, which is you have to take version one of your refrigerator, of your laser printer, of your computer, of your website, and you have to churn it. One, 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 two, one, three, one, four, one, five, two point oh. And I show, I'm going to show you next. This is the product map of Apple, starting from the Apple II till very recently. And so it's not important that you look at all the little details on this, except to get the appreciation that, oh my God, there are a lot of different models. There are a lot of attempts. Shall I say that not every computer on this <laughs> was definitely a success. There was a lot of thrashing to get from Mac 128K to the new colored flat iMacs and M1 MacBooks of today. Churn, baby, churn. Number 10. Number 10 is to ignore the naysayers. When you are an innovator, you are going to encounter naysayers. They're going to tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. What's wrong with copper? What's wrong with harvesting ice? Uh, what's wrong with going to the bank? What's wrong with ATMs where you have to stick in a card? You know, why do we need a mobile-based system? And you need to learn to ignore these people. And the way you learn to ignore these people is by seeing that some people who were very successful were so wrong, so 
don't listen to naysayers. Here's an example. I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, five computers. I have five Macintoshes in my house. This telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union. Western Union in 1876 wrote off telephony. Huh. How do you like that? Probably very few people currently use Western Union. We're all on the phone that Western Union said had too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. And this is a really great example. There is no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson. Ken Olson was the founder of DEC, Digital Equipment Corporation. Fantastic company, great innovator, great entrepreneur. But you know what? He was so successful making mini computers, he could not embrace personal computers. It would be as if, if you have a really successful ice factory, would you start making refrigerators? I hope you would but probably you wouldn't. You would say, why would anybody want a refrigerator? They just have to get ice from the ice factory, my ice factory. The point here is that, you know, some very successful people have predicted that things would fail and they were wrong. And it's because they're conflicted, they have blinders on. It's also because, frankly, they just are losing track of how the market is moving. So, when people tell you it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary, what's wrong with how we do things now? I'm not telling you that whenever you encounter that negativity, it means that you'll succeed. It's not that simple. But when you encounter that negativity, and if you listen to them and never tried, if Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak had met Ken Olson and Ken Olson told them there's no reason to have a computer in their home, and they said, okay, you know, Mr. Olson said that, so let's go learn Fortran and COBOL and go work for DEC, there would be no Apple. And that would be a serious problem for the world right now. Okay. So that is the art of innovation. And that's how, in the words of Steve Jobs, you dent the universe. Get to the next curve.